Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Institute for Policy Studies, or welcome to the Institute for Policy Studies. My name is Nessa Freeman. I'm the events coordinator here at the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, and we're going to have a, uh, a very interesting and timely, or should I say, it's always timely, to do with, uh, to do with uh, justice, social justice. Um, welcome to um, the talk on U.S. militarism in Africa and the book talk and signing for in, in Praise of Blood, The Crimes of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Um, and so we we have here, we, we have, uh, we're proud to have a moderating, and we're, we're fit also video, um, this on video, live on video, both on YouTube, live on YouTube, and then also on the Facebook page of the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, streaming live there, and it'll be, uh, there afterwards in perpetuity for you to share with everybody. Um, we are, and we also have a, a lot of information on the table there that we want to encourage people to take. Um, the co-sponsors of this event are the African Great Lakes um, Action Network, Friends of the Congo, Black Alliance for Peace, and the Institute for Policy Studies. I don't think I'm forgetting anyone. Um, we're proud to have moderating and, and honored to have moderating the event um, our friend from Friends of the Congo, uh, Kambale Musavudi, and he's going to take over here from me. Um, we want to also, uh, we also have, I think you're going to say that, but we have for sale the book, um, In Praise of Blood, uh, by Judy Reaver, um, and then Judy can actually uh, do a signing afterwards if we, if we finish on time and everything. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, we, again, we want to encourage people to, to take the literature. Uh, on behalf of Black Alliance for Peace, full disclosure, I'm also on the, co the coordinating committee of Black Alliance for Peace. We have, and we want to get people to take a look at the AFRICOM fact sheet. We have a fact sheet on AFRICOM that I think is very important and also directly related to what we're going to deal with today. So without further ado, we're going to, I'm going to hand it over to, to uh, Kambali. Thank you. Thank you, Netfa. Uh, thank you, for IPS, for providing the platform for this discussion. Thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. I know it's uh, rainy, it's cold, uh, but you found the time to actually come here to have this discussion. Uh, this event is going to focus on uh, speaking about uh, the region of uh, the African Great Lakes region and having a discussion around uh, Julia Rivers' book, as Netfa mentioned, uh, the book is titled In Praise of Blood. Are the crimes of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Uh, it's a very important book for those of you who haven't read it. I uh, highly suggest that you pick up a copy. Uh, we have some here. I should sign that letter. And I also share it with others. Uh, we want to engage anyone anywhere around the world around the discussions around what has unfolded in the Great List region and how we can end uh, the conflict so that the people of the region from Uganda to Rwanda and Congo can live in peace stability and prosper to transform the African continent. So to start, uh, the way we're going to have this discussion is we'll have a presentation by Judy uh, Rever, and after she speaks, uh, we'll have a discussion of a, an intervention by Claude Gatebouke, and right after that, uh, we'll start the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A is open to those of you in the room who will pass on index cards where you can write your questions. Now, help in getting the questions actually uh, to uh, our panelists. And also for those of you who are on live stream, uh, wherever you are, uh, as soon as we start the Q&A, uh, please leave your comments. Don't post your questions now, because when you do now, I won't have a chance to go back to all the questions. So when Q&A starts, you can leave the comments, and we'll do our best to get all uh, the questions uh, Pose to the to the panelists so we can have a, a good discussion. So to start, um, let me start with uh, so we start with Judy as I mentioned before. Uh, for those of you who do not know who Judy is, uh, Judy is a Montreal journalist and the author of Impress of Blood, as I mentioned. This book re-examines the dynamics of the Rwanda genocide and chronicles nearly three decades of mass violence committed by Paul Kagame's army, the Rwanda Patriot Front. Her research is a narrative synthesis of hundreds of interviews with survivors and Kagame's former 
and it's bolstered uh, with a document uh, leaked from um, the UN Tribunal, as a specific as CTR and other sources. Judy Rember is a graduate of Ryerson School of Journalism in 1997. While working for Radio France Internationale, she went to Congo and Rwanda to cover the humanitarian crisis after Kagame's troops uh, toppled the longtime President Mobutu Sese Seko. She accompanied uh, local aid workers into the Congolese jungle to see firsthand how Rwandan Hutu refugees had been hunted down by the Rwandan Tutsi troops. And she also interviewed dozens of Congolese civilians who were displaced by war. She later reported from West Africa and the Middle East for the French news agency, Agence France Presse. She is now a freelance journalist and has published in the Global and Mail, Open Canada, Le Monde Diplomatique, Digital Journal, and Foreign Policy Journal. Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kambali. Thank you, Matt Bach. Thank you, Jean-Luc Bonnet. Thank you, Jean-Luc Bonnet. For peace, friends of the Congo, and certainly IPS. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here and see your faces. Thank you for standing your ground and maintaining this event in the face of uh, efforts by people who support or are associated with the Rwandan embassy, the Rwandan regime, who wanted to shut this down. So um, I'm really glad to be here to deliver you know, my ideas and talk about my I'd like to just uh, get right into it. I want to talk today about um, mainly U.S. policy and the Western legitimization of violence, of RPF violence in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Um, I'm calling it adding fuel to the fire. And I say that because the Great Lakes region, as I see it and as many people live it, is, is on fire. It, has uh, the fire has burned uh, extensively uh, or with greater energy uh, at some points uh, in the last 20 years, but uh, in 30 years actually, uh, and it dies down a bit, but it's still on fire. And this fire has had unlimited uh, destructive power. So if we think of fire as a chemical reaction, it's a mixture of hot gases that makes fuel and oxygen to burn. Uh, what I'm saying today is the fire that burned Rwanda in 1994 was lit and stoked by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, who I call the RPF, and that's the current regime in power, led by Paul Kagame. The fire that ignited two Congo wars that killed several million Congolese people is the RPF, the fire that's created, armed, and kept an endless stream of warring militias in business in Congo has been the RPF. Now, the ingredients sustaining the fire in Central Africa are the fuel and the oxygen. The fuel, as I see it, is U.S. policy and U.N. capitulation to that policy. The oxygen is the official narrative promoted by Western elites and multiple layers of RPF propaganda, which are the cornerstone of that narrative. So why is this important today? And I just want to talk, give two very brief examples of why the narrative is important, Kagame's moral legitimacy. Uh, Kagame's war is ongoing in Congo. Uh, I want to talk very quickly about two uh, areas. One is Kasai, it's Kasai province, and in mid-2017, very recently, more than 5,000 people have been killed and a million others displaced in this diamond-rich area of Kasai. And one of the key figures uh, creating and stoking the violence was a man named Eric Ruham in Bere. And he is, he's fought in three of Kagame's brutal militias over the last 20 years. And He's a figure that, as part of a misguided internationally brokered peace agreements, has been brought into has been brought into the Congolese army. These people have fueled chaos and fought over local land and resources ever since. Now he has maintained very close ties to Kagame's military intelligence um, department, the DMI. Um, 
in Kessine 2017, two NUN investigators, uh, Michael Sharp, a U.S. citizen, and Swedish national, Zaida Catalan, were brutally murdered while investigating violence in the region. Another area of uh, the Congo uh, is Benin. And Kambali would know that area very well. Uh, Kagame's criminal networks are present in Beni. Uh, Kagame's militia, the M23, which he created, is uh, was effectively uh, dismantled, but it is still very much active. As of 2017, special operations were underway in northern Congo by a man called Delphin Kahimbi. And De Kahimbi is a former member of Kagame's Rwandan-led rebel group, the AFDL. Now, he's allegedly behind some of the recruiting of this militia, which in the Western media we call ADF, and they're calling it a Muslim Islamic uh, extremist militia. But in fact, um, a number of members of this militia are Kenya Rwanda speaking and uh, are linked to Rwanda. A lot of savage massacres occurring there. So. The official narrative of the Rwandan genocide that you hear so much about has remained intact for a quarter of a century. It's very important to go through some of the ideas of the official narrative because that's where Kagame draws his moral legitimacy. What does it say? It, it says essentially there was one category of victim in the Rwandan genocide, the Tutsi ethnic group, and one category of perpetrator, the Hutus. The official story says that Paul Kagame and Tutsi race in Uganda stopped the genocide against Tutsis and restored peace. Most Western experts who critically examine the regime do not question the fundamental tenets of the official narrative. When they do, they downplay the scale and scope of RPF's violence. <coughs> the official story, along with geopolitical interests, continue to drive global policy toward Central Africa. Just briefly, uh, on a philosophical level, like truth, what is, what is truth? There are different types. There's truth based on coherence and consensus, uh, that what we say is based on what we observe. There are partial truths, emerging truths, denied truth, which involves refusing to validate a historical experience or event, it's, called, it's like lying by omission. In law, a lie by omission is the intentional failure to tell the truth in a situation that requires disclosure. The official narrative of the genocide was forged in a climate of violence and propaganda. Since then, the government of Paul Kagame has killed, blackmailed, jailed, or silenced anyone who has openly challenged this narrative. Now, this matters because the deception has a devastating impact. The United States, its allies, and the UN have lied by omission. They have hidden crucial information about RPF violence in 1994. They have removed documents from the public record. RPF techniques to silence truth tellers and US and UN attempts to hide or deny RPF atrocities have led to protracted violence in Central Africa. And that's the central point I want to make today. I want to go through uh, some uh, US policy examples of supporting, protecting, covering up, and praising Kagame's regime over the last 30 years. Since the late 1980s, Washington has provided steady military and political support to Uganda which in turn provided troops, training, and weapons to the RPF when they invaded in 1990. And when the RPF invaded through uh, the north from Uganda in 1990, for four, almost four years they launched, launched a scorched earth campaign, displacing a million people in the north and ethnically cleansing that area. That set the stage for the 1994 genocide. For decades, the U.S. has used sophisticated satellites all over the world, but certainly in, in Central Africa, Canon Keyhole, digital camera orbiting the Earth, remote sensing, um, Landsat mosaic satellites which are able to detect military activity, 
killings, fires, changes in earth, such as mass graves, these satellites would provide evidence of crimes in RPF occupied zone. But the United States has not delivered that evidence. The U.S. actively thwarted international attempts to intervene to save lives during the genocide and supported the RPF's military sweep to power in July 1994. U.S. and U.N. insiders were aware that RPF Tutsi-led troops were killing Hutu civilians in the north and east of the country during the genocide from late April onward. There were U.N. protection cables that showed that, uh, that the Kagame's troops were chasing, hacking, and, and burning people in May. Those reports uh, were buried, and the United States praised the RPF and Kagame as heroes for halting massacres. In September 1994, the U.S. tried to discredit findings by a refugee uh, consultant called Robert Gersony. He found the RPF systematically massacred Hutu civilians in the zones that he visited with his team, about one-third of Rwanda. Uh, the U.S. made sure that the U.N. kept that explosive report <coughs> secret. In later years, Washington <coughs> acted illegally by ensuring the ICTR did not prosecute the RPF for these systematic massacres, and I'm going to come back to this later. The U.S. Embassy, a few years later, helped plan Kagame's invasion of Zaire. This is very important. In 1996-97, uh, and now that invasion was aimed essentially at toppling Mobutu Sese Seko. The source for this is Gregory Stanton, who worked in the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department. I mean, he, he knew what was going on, and he was there at the time visiting the embassy, the U.S. Embassy in uh, Kigali in Rwanda. Other forms of support. U.S. engineering giant Bechtel helped RPF rebels unseat Mobutu by providing satellite data and other information that led to his ouster. ouster. Uh, Bechtel commissioned and paid for NASA satellite studies of the country and for infrared maps of the mineral potential. Bechtel ties with U.S. intelligence are well known and have earned it the moniker of the working arm of the CIA. Um, the CIA established a satellite dish at Mobutu's residence in late 96 at the uh, beginning of the invasion after it was seized by Kagame's rebels. Washington actively downplayed the number of Hutu refugees being chased and killed in the forests of Congo by Kagame's rebels. We also have Western multinational mining companies striking deals and providing money to Kagame's rebels during their military sweep. America Mineral Fields taking mining. U.S. officials Investment bankers and mining interests organized a junket, a trip to Congo to RPF-controlled zones during the war before Mobutu was overthrown as Kagame's rebels were killing Congolese and Rwandan Hutu refugees. The senior U.S. official on that junket was Robin Sanders, Director of African Affairs for the U.S. National Security Council. In October 1997, five months after the regime change, because that's what it was, the unseating of Mobutu and the opening up of Congo, it was a regime change. The Boston Globe reported that European intelligence claimed U.S. special forces had participated in fighting in eastern Zaire. A Washington lob lobbied against a U.N. investigation of RPF killings in Congo, and it has ensured ever since that Kagame was never indicted at the ICC displayed clear evidence of his command control role in sponsoring warlords in Congo since 2002. Um, so basically, uh, the U.S. and the U.K., being the biggest financial, political, and military supporters of Kagame's government, uh, Kigali's receiving from uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and other countries about a billion dollars a year. The U.S. provides about a fifth of that amount. Very substantial. Now, in terms of U.S. military assistance to the RPF, it's actually difficult to estimate the full extent of U.S. military transfers, aid, and training 
because a lot of it escapes congressional oversight. Some of it's through private contractors linked to the Pentagon. We've seen joint command exchange, exchange training and private military contract training uh, that has been directly and indirectly tied to Rwandan forces implicated in gross human rights violations. We know that the U.S. through AFRICOM has more military operations in Africa now than the Middle East. 22% of U.S. humanitarian aid to Africa is distributed by the Pentagon, so there's certainly a weaponization of aid. UN policy as dangerous fuel. The powerful uh, and U.S. policy, powerful insiders at the U.S. Uh, establishment and military establishment, as I said, have hidden these crimes, that uh, some of which I've just described, protected the RPF from prosecution <coughs> and international tribunals, and peddled this false narrative about what he did in 1994, allowing him to infiltrate international institutions. So what that has done has emboldened him. His regime, over the last 30 years, has been highly effective in mass, spree, and serial killing. Washington has, therefore, enabled Kagame's crimes and become an ingredient in the fire that has burned in the Great Lakes region of Africa since. So just um, a very short comment about the international apologia as oxygen for the fire. Um, Kim Ballet mentioned that I got into um, researching this through the prism of Congo in 97. Uh, I saw the direct impact of Kagame's violence uh, in the Congolese forests and in villages and towns. At that time, we had intellectual elites like Philip Gorovitch from The New Yorker, British and British academic Alex DeWall, who legitimized uh, RPF violence, not only in Rwanda, but certainly in Congo. Thousands of Rwandan refugees who were chased further into Congo were prey for Kagame. They were viewed in Western media uh, as either genocidaire uh, or their families were fearing justice. So um, that that I think is is key. I, I, I want I mention these two individuals because I see them uh, as among kingmakers, uh, among Western elites who have helped um, enable. Paul Kagame's impunity over the last quarter century. Many people have built their careers around this propaganda and one-sided genocide narrative. They are invested in protecting the perpetrator and they have helped make Paul Kagame king. Um, there are so many of these people in academia, in mainstream journalism, uh, in political and military establishments. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm just going to uh, mention a few of the top of my list here today. Bill Clinton. With Madeleine Albright at the time, during the genocide, helped thwart UN intervention to halt the massacres of Tutsis and Hutus in a bid to allow the RPF to seize power. Clinton has stated that Kagame's freed the hearts and minds of the Rwandan people. Under Clinton's watch, the U.S. greenlit the invasion of Congo by Kagame's forces. And when the U.N. mapping report was released, which, which uh, revealed uh, that Kagame's troops may have committed genocide against Congolese Hutu and uh, Rwandan Hutus, Clinton said he was not going to prejudge Kagame because he really didn't know much what happened there. Susan Rice is another kingmaker. She's a former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. She's helped shield Kagame from international censure at the UN. She once worked for the strategic analysis uh, firm here in Washington called IntelliBridge, whose company officials include ex-CIA Director John Deutsch and National Security Advisor Anthony Lake. The firm has done work for Kagame. When she was Obama's ambassador to the UN, Rice uh, watered down a security um, council resolution that, na that named and shamed Rwanda for supporting 
the uh, M23. So she's uh, worked to downplay his crimes and protect him, as certainly at the UN. Oh. Tony Blair, um, former UK Prime Minister. Sorry, he has been one of Kagame's biggest cheerleaders. And he's responsible for kind of opening uh, the tax of uh, financial aid, international aid for, for Kagame. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry about this. So, and he's built this cult of personality around Kagame. Okay. I don't know. I don't For those of you who will be interested, we will make sure to give you a copy of the slide. So make sure that you are signing up uh, the table, and at the end of the event, we will email you a copy of the slide so you can have it. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, so Tony Blair is somebody who's, you know, for, give you an example, uh, on the 20th anniversary of the genocide, Britain poured half a billion pounds into the impoverished nation. We also have a number of other key people, I won't mention all of them, who helped create in books, in literature, uh, and in NGOs, which had an influence at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the official narrative. And Rakia Omar and Alex DeWall, whose name I mentioned earlier, who worked for an NGO called African Rights. Um, they wrote a defining book called Death, Defiance, and Despair, and that had a very big uh, impact on uh, the legal proceedings initially at the ICTR. And also Human Rights Watch has picked up, uh, has cited African Rights and D&D's &D, uh, work about 42 po uh, times in, in their seminal account of the genocide. Philip Gorovich, I just, I'll, I'll end with him. I've got a lot of other people to speak about, but I'm just going to end it there in terms of the King Knight. Philip Gorovich, he's for years extolled the virtues of Kagame. His work has been highly ideological. Um, he was critical of UN efforts to probe RPF atrocities of Rwandan and Congolese Hutus. Um, many years ago, and then when the mapping report was released in 2010, he refused to address the substance of the accusations against Kagame's troops that they may have committed genocide. Instead, he wrote that it was difficult to see how this could lead to any trials. Um, there was very little detail connecting individually identified perpetrators or victims. So he um, tried to, I think, undermine uh, or, or uh, make it sound as if this investigation was not uh, legitimate. Uh, one of the things that I've been very frustrated with over the years is the lack of empirical studies, uh, qualitative and quali uh, quantitative studies about why Rwandan, in particular Rwandan Hutus, fled Rwanda in 1994 in the first place. And this is probably one of the reasons we don't fully understand the dynamics of the genocide and that we don't know enough about what the RPF did to Hutus. A number of academics, journalists, and other observers have ruled out uh, my thesis and uh, others who have said the same thing, that the RPF committed genocide without doing rigorous research on the RPF's record, without doing interviews and collecting interviews from the uh, Hutus that fled uh, during the genocide of 1994. So my book, In Praise of Blood, um, is based on more than 200 sources, direct and contextual witnesses, and they're survivors of atrocities. They're former members of Kagame's military, and in particular deserters who are not aligned with political party in exile. I've interviewed aid workers, 
officials at the UN, the ICTR, and Western governments. And the testimony is bolstered by leaked documents, like Kambale said, from the ICTR Special Investigations Unit. This was a clandestine unit that probed RPF crimes. Uh, I also have a fair amount of exculpatory evidence from ICTR trial proceedings. So the core conclusions of my book, RPF ignited the genocide by shooting down the plane carrying the Rwandan and Burundian presidents. Immediately after the plane attack, soldiers from the RPF military intelligence, high command, battalion, and training wing began carrying out systematic massacres of Hutu civilians in areas the RPF had seized. Mobile forces operated quickly from the north and headed a southeast through the prefectures. Well-planned operations that were not reprisal killings, they were preemptive and began in zones already under their control in April 1994. They targeted Hutus in swamps and fields, <coughs> community leaders first, then peasants, peasants. Large groups of Hutus were called to meetings, killed with guns, grenades, and Agafuni hose. Hutus were dumped in mass graves with Tutsis massacred by Hutu militias. The RPF loaded thousands of people onto trucks, mostly at night, brought them to Gabiro where they were shot and burned. Journalists were, who were in Rwanda during the genocide were uh, monitored highly by the RPF and they were strictly controlled. So the RPF killings of Hutus I posit were highly organized, systematic, amounted to attempts to destroy in part Hutus as an ethnic group. These operations continued to a lesser degree in later years. This at the same time, of course, as Tutsis were systematically slaughtered in Hutu controlled zones and were victims of a genocide. Hutu militia and elements of the state, often local, committed genocide against Hutus. I also say that the RPF fueled the genocide against Tutsis by infiltrating, this is quite complicated, infiltrating Hutu militias by various, with various members of their commandos and helped kill Tutsis in clandestine uh, operations throughout Rwanda. And the infiltration by RPF commandos of Hutu militias throughout the country was key to the RPF's success in seizing territory, and it gives us clues about how the genocide unfolded. More research is needed to understand the genocide against Tutsis. Tutsi survivors and RPF deserters live in terror, and many are afraid to give their accounts. <coughs> so, recap. The assumptions versus evidence. Paul Kagame stopped the genocide committed by Hutus against Tutsis. No, he ignited and fueled the genocide of Tutsis. RPF massacres of Hutu civilians during and after the genocide were essentially reprisal killings. No, immediately after shooting down the plane, RPF organized death squads targeting Hutu community leaders and they managed, the, and peasants, and they concealed these massacres. It was well planned, organized, and massive, and it continued on a smaller scale for years. Civil participation in the genocide was only Hutu against Tutsi. This is not true. Tutsi civilians also were perpetrators. They participated in the violence against Hutus, directly assisting the RPF as well. The UN tribunal set up to try the most serious violations committed in, R in Rwanda in 1994 fulfilled its mandate by convicting more than 60 individuals, all with ties to the former Hutu regime, therefore contributing to the country's difficult process of reconciliation. That's another assumption. That is bogus. The, the United States influenced the UN tribunal in Kagame's favor shielded the RPF from prosecution and cemented his impunity and dictatorship for decades to come. So the propaganda system that it's worth um, doing some reading on has 
uh, established the RPF moral legitimacy, demonized the Hutu population, steered legal proceedings uh, against uh, Hutu opponents, and garnered support from the international community. So, going forward, um, so many whistleblowers uh, and witnesses and victims have tried to alert the international community to these crimes, but as I said, they've been intimidated, jailed, silenced, or killed, and the West concealing, deliberately concealing this evidence has not helped. There's a number of uh, evidence and crimes and investigations that were um, completed that never made it to the indictment stage and never were prosecuted. I mention these in my book. One of the key points I'd like to share with you as I wrap this up and uh, let Claude speak is uh, a Faustian bargain that was, um, that was uh, struck in 2003 uh, at the ICTR, um, th th investigations that showed that Kagame's troops had shot down the plane, massacred Hutus, and fueled the genocide against Tutsis. The ICTR clandestine <coughs> investigative unit had this prima facie evidence, and the U.S. Ambassador for War Crimes, Pierre Prosper, engin engineered a deal that transferred the jurisdiction of uh, investigating and prosecuting RPF crimes from the United Nations to the Rwandan government itself. So the deal was illegal and a breach of trust and it amounted to letting the killers investigate themselves. So I guess the takeaway is that, uh, you know, uh, there's a sense from victims anyhow that uh, they're, they're uh, their suffering doesn't matter. The refusal um, to to prosecute the RPF and the internet has the international community is basically saying to the victims that they're comfortable with Kagame's crimes. Briefly, geopolitical interests that are driving these policies um, we've seen uh, over the last 30 years. 20 years in particular, Washington shifting support to military and political actors who can open up the Great Lakes region to valuable strategic minerals and provide proxies to fight their wars on terror. Rwanda, as its trump card, is a valuable uh, contributor to UN peacekeeping. They have forces in Mali and Sudan. These countries are important nations in the Sahel, which contains vast uh, deposits of oil and natural gas which Washington seeks for its energy needs. There's also the criminal liability aspect for the U.S. government uh, being uh, complicit in Kagame's crimes because they had knowledge of these crimes that were being committed and did not try to stop them. So it could be reasonably argued that military assistance and satellite technology provided by U.S. to Kagame's troops amount to aiding and abetting these crimes. So um, my last um, minute will just, uh, I'll share with you some policy recommendations because I understand it's really important to look forward uh, and see how we can address some of these things. I think we need to join efforts uh, in, in establishing a true historical record um, uh, devoid of propaganda. We need to listen to Congolese activists and civilians <coughs> and Rwandans who flee. We need to bring their story to the attention of Congress. We need to actively encourage Washington to reevaluate and reexamine its ties with Paul Kagame and the RPF, halt U.S. Rwanda military cooperation agreements, remove Rwanda from UN peacekeeping, support the creation of an ad hoc tribunal for crimes in Congo, lobby the ICC to investigate and prosecute Kagame for crimes he's committed since uh, the ICC was established in 2002. Help me get material proof of RPF crimes for civil and international courts by gaining access under the Freedom of Information Act to crucial U.S. satellite images from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. The NGA is part of your Department of Defense and they have the material proof of what the RPF was doing 
in their areas uh, during, uh, that they quickly seized during the genocide, also what the RPF did in Congo. And I've tried to access through the Freedom of Information uh, Act some of these images. First, the uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency told me they didn't have these images. Then, uh, when I pushed them some more, they said those images would remain classified in order to protect national security. So whose national security is the United States trying to protect? 